So why don't you go ahead and grab your Bible. You can turn to Matthew 7. Here's where we're going to be. Matthew 7. Everyone, grab a Bible. You have one in front of you there. Well, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? You sound great today. Hey, on December the 1st, that's in two weeks, we're going to all be gathering here in our sanctuary throughout Advent. We're inviting everyone to come and join us both hours. And uh, I hope that you already are uh, prepared to invite friends to come. Folks who may not come to church, normally they will come at Christmas time. It's no better time to be here. I don't know if you saw this, um, this picture online, a picture of the, the Pope, Pope Francis in his, his white puffer jacket. Did you see this? Um, with, a, um, with a cross there. Maybe you saw this one, President-elect um, Donald Trump. He posted this one of himself praying. Looks like he might be in the Capitol building or somewhere. Maybe he's in church. Um, or trash lining the streets of Paris with the Eiffel Tower in the background. This went viral as well. Or how about this one, the Pentagon going up in smoke. Um, this one went viral as well, especially after um, the Rush, Russia's official propaganda um, put it on blast. And then, uh, like all of these pictures, these people that you see here, none of them are real. None of them happened. None of these things happened. We live in a world where it's hard to know what's real and what's not real. And we live in a world where there are imposters and those pretending to be real. It's hard to know what's real anymore. All these are AI-generated pictures. There's AI videos out there. And uh, before these things go viral, people don't know they're not even real. So how do you know what's real? We're going to talk about that, not just, you might be saying, well, I'm not online a whole lot. I don't see that. I've never seen those pictures. I, it doesn't have anything to do with me. It can happen in real life. Frank Abagnale, he was one of the most, probably the most famous imposter in modern day history. In the 1960s, this guy pretended to be a pilot, a doctor, and an attorney with no training in any of those fields. After a million miles 250 flights with Pan Am. He was finally found out. There was a, a, a movie you might have seen some years ago called Catch Me If You Can, um, starring Leonardo DiCaprio. He couldn't pretend to look exactly like Leonardo, but, um, but a movie about him. And then later he ends up on a lot of shows back in the day. It was Johnny Carson, among other places, telling his story. He wrote a memoir. And then it was found out later in a book that was presented that um, actually he was lying about some of his lies. Imagine that. Anna Sorokin is a Russian-born woman who used the alias Anna Delvey. She claimed to be this wealthy German heiress, ended up among the, the influential, the most wealthy people in New York City, gaining access into you know, these upscale hotels, significant financial loans that came her way. It all fell apart with her eventual arrest, charged with grand larceny. After she got out of prison, you might have seen her recently. It's not in my rotation, but she was on Dancing with the Stars with an, with an ice-mandated ankle bracelet that was uh, blinged out while she danced. Evidently, she couldn't pretend to be a good dancer. She was eliminated after two weeks. So um, you, can't, you can't fake it, right, everywhere. You can't do it all over the place. Robert Hansen was an FBI agent for the United States. Little did, well, no, none of his colleagues knew. He was actually a double agent. And he spied for the Soviet Union and Russia for two decades before finally being convicted only after he had become the most damaging spy in U.S. history, giving the Russians counterintelligence, nuclear strategy, all kinds of things. How in the world? All of these are examples of how imposters can blend in into highly focused, close-knit groups where we anticipate that those among us actually live up to certain credentials and verifications with vigilance that has prevented that kind of infiltration. How does it happen? What's real? What's not real? Pilate's question to Jesus is still relevant today. What is truth? What is real? <laughs> what is not real? 
and a young rabbi shows up on the hills just north of the Sea of Galilee. Some of, some of us have been to this spot. And he preaches a sermon. Not just a sermon, but the sermon of all sermons. And we've been walking through it throughout the fall. If you're a guest today, and I've met some of you who are brand new here today, we've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount. I, I've found myself along with others. I wish we were staying in this for the whole year. Because here, and we've taken a deep dive, but here we, we look to see what does it really look like to live as a true disciple of Jesus. Because we see in our day, many have got it wrong. We have a lot of pretenders, a lot of imposters. This passage will teach us, Jesus is teaching us in Matthew 7, how to discern. That's what it's all about, discernment. How to discern between true teachers and false teachers. But don't miss this. It goes much deeper than that. It will help us determine to determine who's real, who's not real. I've said it in recent days, the number one challenge, I believe, for the American church, and this is not a new thing, I'm sure it's global in many ways, is that it's possible to identify, self-identify as a Christian and not be a disciple of Jesus. In fact, I think revival would take place in all of our churches and across the land if those who claim to be Christian would choose to be disciples of Jesus. It would change the game. And we're going to talk about that today because that's who we're seeking to be. Jesus only called disciples. And again, if you're a guest here, this is what we're all about here at our church. We're just seeking to grow to be just like him. And Jesus' words here today are haunting and will challenge all of us. And they're designed to do so. You know, with every election, um, there's all kinds of you know, commentary on how this happened and how Trump won and all the things and, and who voted for him. And always in every election cycle, there's this, this group that they want to focus on at times, the evangelicals, right? The evangelical. We, we claim ourselves to be evangelical or, or nowadays, wait, wait, how, how are you defining that? Because it's not just a voting block, right? Evangelical, rightly understood, is a theological distinction, I read this week, if you get, dig, dig deeper into the lives of those who claim to be evangelical, you discover that about 41% of them go to church once a year or less. I would submit to you, those are not disciples of Jesus. Who are not a part of the body. Because you see, it's possible, it's possible to be self-deceived. And this is what Jesus is getting to here. Eternity weighs in the balance as we read his words today. And, and what I want us to look at is, is when we open the Bible, I just want to remind us here, I want to remind us um, what a precious gift we have in our hands. You have the Bible in front of you. You have it open. It's the only book that is from God Almighty to us. Every other book that claims to be is false. It's not real, it's an imposter, it's fake. This is the word of God. And it's the only book when you open it, every time you open it and read it, the author is right there beside you. How about this, if you're in Christ, in you, helping to interpret it and showing you what's happening. Hebrews 4.12 says that it's, it's piercing the division of soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It cuts, discerning the thoughts and intentions of every one of us as we read it. No other book like it. This is a gift to us. And I've been to places, even in recent days, where people don't have the Word of God. And yet we do. And we discard it. Some of us dismiss it. Are you in the Word? That will be a constant challenge today. As we look at this passage... Where Jesus shows us three things. Okay, if you take notes on sermons, the, these three things will help us discern who are real disciples and who are not. And we're looking at ourselves first, humbly coming before the Lord, 
before we start pulling out the speck in others' eyes, we look at ourselves. He says that appearance is misleading. We've already talked about that a little bit. Actions are revealing, and accountability is coming. Look at verse 15. See, the thing about all these imposters, AI images, whatever else, is that they appear to be real. So Jesus says, beware. This is the word. It means be constantly diligent. Watch out. Be awake. Okay, be woke in the original sense of the word. Be aware, alert, constantly watching. What shall we watch for? He'll tell us. This passage is all about discernment. I've asked the question recently, uh, what does it feel like to be wrong? This is why we need to come humbly before the Lord because we've said that, well, we, it feels embarrassing. You know, it's shameful. I want to get it right. Uh, I, want to, I want to change is what it feels like. But no, that's what it feels like to know that you're wrong. Be, see, see, being wrong feels exactly like being right if you don't know that you're right or that you're wrong. And so what we do is we, we think about false teachers and and. I think most of us would say, probably like me, I'm prone to say, well, whoever doesn't believe what I believe, they're false. That's false teaching. When instead, let, let's step back and let's let Jesus determine how do you measure this? Because discernment distinguishes between that which seems right, but is actually wrong. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Discernment, Charles Spurgeon said it this way, is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. This is where we get in trouble. And there's an almost right gospel that leads to an eternity apart from God. Proverbs 14, 12, it says, there's a way that seems right to a man or a woman, but it leads to death. The intriguing thing about that verse is not that it leads to death, but that it seems so right. And, and, and his words come to us today to really look at our hearts. Who are these false prophets? This uh, really turned a light on for me when I realized, ah, he's talking about their religious leaders. He is talking about the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sadducees. He's already called them out earlier in the Sermon on the Mount where he said, there's a higher righteousness than these who are actually teaching you and leading you. There's a higher righteousness. And then the whole Sermon on the Mount is about this higher righteousness. Jesus is saying, those who are real, not false, are not those who know, have all the knowledge. Not simply those who may be amazing communicators, brilliant intellectually. In our day, celebrity pastors, everybody's following after them. Or those who have multiple degrees, that guy, that gal is super smart, must be real. Jesus would say of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, that's not it. They're wrong. That is bold because he's right. Jesus is saying those who will follow after everything that he's been preaching in Matthew 5 through 7, an attitude and a heart of the Beatitudes that leads to this kind of life, those are the real ones. Others are fake, and we are so quickly, easily self deceived. False teachers may have the knowledge, be amazing communicators again, but they do not display the fruit of the Spirit. And what our choir just sang about a moment ago, what does he require of us but to act justly, right? to seek justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before our God? In a world where even Christians act like the word justice is a cuss word, the word of God throughout the Old Testament and all throughout all of Jesus' teaching is to seek justice among those who are being oppressed, to raise up the poor. That's what it is. This real righteousness is not simply to be saved, to be made righteous, yes, 
but to respond and then bring his justice into the world. Those who follow after him do exactly that. An early application here. As we look through an American lens, a kind of leadership that looks a lot more like worldly power than anything we find in scripture, we can be easily deceived. Because often that kind of leadership that we see in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus lived it out. It can look like weakness in our world. To extend grace to others and mercy, to die to yourself, confounds the masses. And yet the Lord says that, that's it. That's the real one. We just got back from the Caribbean basin, a place we've been involved for 25 years. And um, we're dodging hurricanes and earthquakes and all kinds of craziness among people who are oppressed, have no agency whatsoever. And I can tell you that I found myself among the greatest in the kingdom of God. I have very little who are pursuing the Lord and persevering to serve him and to pastor their churches and to lead people to Jesus. It's a flipped upside down kingdom, isn't it? But an early application, don't be swayed by appearances. Beyond the surface, just as a predator may blend in and deceive its prey, false teachers can appear trustworthy because spiritual harm. Appearances are deceiving, but how would we know? This is what he gets to next. Actions are revealing. Now, it's, it's important to understand there are two types of fruit. He's going to talk about fruits, the produce, the evidence. There's the fruit of doctrine, and there's the fruit of action. And that's where Jesus leans more so. Look at verse 16. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from Thorn bushes? The obvious answer, no. Or figs from thistle? No. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. The healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can the diseased tree bear good fruit. He's saying our actions reveal our character, right? The outside reveals what's on the inside. There's the fruit of our doctrine, but there's the fruit of our lives. True disciples look like Jesus. That's how you know. And yes, over time, false disciples, they may have knowledge, but they're not marked by humility, compassion, love, and kindness. In fact, First John 4, 8, you know this. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. Love is the ultimate marker. Are they loving, compassionate people? Then likely they're showing, revealing that they're a good tree. Jesus says the good tree can bear good fruit. And he gets to, to the fact that it's, it's the health of the roots, right, that run. The root system that runs into the ground and, and brings about life. It's, it's, it's connected to the vine. It's in a soil, nutrient-rich soil that helps it to thrive. So, so how do we discern? Well, those who are motivated by the love of grace, the gospel of grace, and then all of our lives are given over to him. It's an act of the will. It's a function of the will. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Evaluate teachers by their lives. Yes, by their doctrine but by their lives and the impact of their teaching, is it aligned with Jesus' teaching? If it's not, they're false gospel. It's a false gospel. And these, of course, are the Pharisees would, would, would say, you have to work your way, be good enough yourself to get to heaven. Jesus comes and he says, can't do it. You know you can't do it. It's the gospel of grace. We must humble ourselves, die to ourselves, and receive his grace. Jesus is saying you, you can recognize true followers of Jesus. And, and already the spirit is working, I know, in, in, in this sermon. And you're thinking maybe about yourself. Uh, you're thinking about others that you know. Are they saved? Are they not saved? I would say this. Once we receive Christ, his grace, we have died to ourselves. And we're now on a trajectory to become like him. There's a desire that's been changed in us to pursue him. 
do you have that desire in your life? How would you know? Well, I'm preaching to the proverbial choir today. You're here. It's a good sign. You desire to be among God's people. You want to make this a priority for you and your family. Many people don't. And it would cause some to question. Are you in his word? I mean, do you really want to grow in him? And do you understand that this is how you do it? You say, well, I'm not sure how to do that. We have our dwell journal. It's easy. And, and not only that, but we have our, our Advent um, guide that's coming to you just in another week. And you can grab it and all of us together. Walking. And, and here's the thing. Dwelling with him, in him, and becoming more like him. Are you a member of the church? Are you, are you a committed member of the church? As we saw Andrew and Libby and Margot who were baptized, have you, have you made the decision? That I'm in. Or are you just still kind of outside looking in? Are you still just dating the church? Or are you committed? Those are signs. Those are signs that you're in or you're out. Jesus says, we can know. We can know. Now, this is really interesting. In Genesis 1, chapter 11, you've probably read this. This is one of those verses you just kind of read over that helps explain what I'm talking about here. God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees, bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. Okay, watch that phrase, on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their kinds. And trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind. He says three times. And God said, this is good. Watch this. A natural law that governs the natural universe becomes a spiritual law that governs our relationship with God. Every child in here knows you don't plant a pumpkin seed and expect an apple tree. You don't plant an orange seed and expect a banana tree not going to happen. Whatever you put in the ground is going to come up later. Here's a sign. Are you sowing the seed of God's truth and his spirit and his word into your life? You will reap in kind what you sow. It's why Paul says in Galatians 6, what Jay read for us earlier, don't be deceived Friends, this, these are like the words of Jesus. Don't, don't miss this. God will not be mocked. He will have the last word. You can't pretend before God Almighty. Whatever one sows, it will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Eternal Zoe life here and now and into eternity. Let us not grow weary, he says, of doing good. Don't give up, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Some of us have thought about giving up, and the Lord is, is challenging. No, stay in. No, 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 go deeper. See, no farmer worth his salt will go out, on, out into the field and toss out a couple of seed and then come back the next day and say, where's my bumper crop? You didn't plant anything. Are you planting? The more you plant, the more you're going to grow. The more you sow, are you sowing into God's word? Are you in his word? Again, are you a member? Are you all in? And for some of us who've been at this a long time, are you serving others? Not just in the church, yes, but outside the church. Are you living like Jesus, seeking to grow like him every single day? And all of us, yes, we're still struggling with our, our sin and challenges in our lives, but we're on a trajectory. I have committed my will to him, and I want to be just like him. That is the rest of my life, because there's coming a day. Because, you see, he says appearances are receiving, I mean, are deceiving. Actions are revealing, but accountability is coming for every single one of us. And it's coming soon and very soon. Verse 19 Every tree that does not bear fruit, good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. It's not, not producing anything, so just cut it down and, and then burn it up. It needs to be done away with. 
Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone, here it is, who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. Okay, don't miss this. Lord, Lord, kurios, kurios. This is what every uh, person would, would call the Lord. Lord, Lord, Lord. They're, they got their, how about this, their, their orthodoxy. They got it right. Their theology is right. In fact, not only is their theology right, their heart is in it. Like they're emotionally engaged. Lord, Lord. You might know this is a, this is a term of endearment. This is like a superlative. Lord, Lord. They're passionate about this. They're singing songs on Sunday morning. How can we know? I mean, they even, not only that, look at this. Many will say to me, on that day, this is a reference to judgment day, when we will all stand before God. And he says, many will stand before me, Lord, Lord. Didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? That word do, that, that's the word produce. The word bear is produce, is what that means. That's why these two passages are, are connected. In your English Bible, probably like mine, these teachings are often separated. They're one and the same. He never gets off of what's fake and what's not fake, what's real and what's false. And here they're saying, did we not produce many great things in your name? And he says, I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You workers of lawlessness. Other translation, evildoers. Wow. I don't know about you. Have you ever prophesied or cast out demons? The point is they're doing the work. I mean, they're in doing the work. So again, wait, I thought actions reveal who fa who's false and who's not. What's happening here, there is the gospel of grace, okay, doctrine and action, gospel of grace that we receive from him and don't miss this Jesus says in Luke 9 23 you want to come after me you want to be the real deal you want to be real he doesn't say oh, get baptized and join a church that's real no 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 there's a function of the will watch this you want to come after you want to be a disciple not a Christian but a disciple you deny yourself, function of the will. You die to yourself daily and follow me. We're on a journey for you to be conformed into my image. That is a disciple. Are you on the journey? Are you on this trajectory? And let's be honest. Yes, life looks something like this often. But are you on the move? Have you responded to his grace? And are you now ready to worship him with your life? This is what Christ has called us to. And this is what separates the two. It says in Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed for every person, each of us, to die once and face judgment. There's coming a day when we will stand before the Lord and this, this word is not meant to scare anyone. It's meant to convict everyone, all of us. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. Because we can go all the way back through redemptive history. We see the Garden of Eden. There's two trees. One is the tree of life. One, one is, is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we've done like our forerunners, Adam and Eve, who, who say, we'll determine what's right and wrong. I'll determine what's real and what's not real. I will take that upon myself. I'll live for myself, my own will. And we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And as the story unfolds, Isaiah prophesies that there's going to grow this shoot out of, the out of the stump of Jesse, and it's going to, its branch branches will come forth from the roots that run deep and the seed of God is planted in a virgin named Mary who gives birth to the God-man Jesus, fully God, fully man, so that he might then become the tree of life. At the center of Eden is the tree of life. 
that represents the presence of God and his sovereign provision for eternal life. Jesus comes, dies on a tree crafted by broken, fallen humans, and he then is raised up the first installment, the first fruits of resurrection so that we too could follow him in resurrected life for eternity to come as we give our lives to him. Friends, there's a guarantee of resurrection and eternal life for every person who's received his grace. We're not saved by works, but saving faith always is followed with works. You can know if a person is saved or not. Do they have a life that's on a trajectory to become more and more like Jesus? What shall we do? Three quick points of application before we close. You've got to remain rooted in Christ. Are you rooted in him? Are you, are you doing life with other believers? We don't do this in isolation. Jesus said, you abide in me and I in you. A branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Are you abiding in him? Are you dwelling in his word? He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. You see, we've got to stay in him. And if we do, he says, he bears, she bears much fruit. It happens. And I'm seeing it all around me. From members of our church who love Jesus, we've got to be deeply rooted. Do you have good soil? Are you tending to the soil of your heart? Or are you filling it up with all kinds of things of this world? You're going to reap what you sow. The Bible says instead, Jesus goes on to say, those who, who've sown the good soil, the seed that falls in the good soil, those who understand it, who actually act on it, he indeed bears fruit produces fruit and yields, in some cases, 100, 60, 30-fold. Cultivate good soil. Tend to it. Part of that, come back next week to worship the Lord. Be in his word as you enter into the day tomorrow. Cultivate the soil by tending to it. And, and we're going to challenge everyone today, if you're not in a connect group, we want to encourage you to do so. You hear this all the time. But are you? Uh, do you just show up and then kind of leave? Or are you actually seeking to do life with others? I know many of us are serving and we're in worship. But some of us, you need to get in the connect group. There's a, there's a, a number there. You can text it right now. And you can write this down, 74899. Some of us need to get serious about growing with other believers. Today's your day. And we'll be outside like, Keith Lowry, myself, well, others of us will be uh, just right out the doors here in the back to help you and to guide you. We've got to be rooted, stay rooted in him and reflect his character in everything you do. Seek to be just like him. And as we do, what does this fruit look like? Well, it looks like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what it looks like. Those are things that aren't really celebrated in our world today. But that's how we know. With all the talk that I hear in my circles about biblical fidelity and interpreting the Bible correctly, yes, all that's important. But as we've noted, if it doesn't end up looking like this, looking like Jesus, you're doing it wrong. It's a life that looks like him. And then what he can say of us, We'll, we'll let our light shine before others and they'll see our good works and then they will see the fruit. They will glorify God who's in heaven. And then finally, remain faithful to the call. This is a lifetime journey. And today, yes, today is to convict us all and to, to help us look deeply into our hearts and see where we stand before him. But don't give up. Some of you are here today and you're you're, you're weary and you're tired or maybe you're thinking about giving up. Uh, maybe there was a day when you said, I used to abide in him, not so much now. I want to call you back to him today. So that each of us, friends, when judgment day does come and is coming, we can say along with Paul, let's all read this together. Can we do that? I want us to read, I think it's on the screen. It's, yeah, 2 Timothy 4. Let's read this together. If this is aspirational, for many of us, it's no. I, I want to be able to say this. 
along with Paul. Let's say it today on this day. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which is the Lord. The righteous judge will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Let's pray together. What shall you do? What shall we do? How has the Lord spoken to you? In a holy moment, right now, what kind of business do you need to do with God? You've heard many challenges that I've offered audibly. The Spirit has spoken in other ways to your heart. Do you know him today? Today is the day of salvation. If you don't know for certain right now, you can, by faith, receive his grace. Say yes to him. Which is a dying to your own will and responding to the great love, the grace that he has extended to you. He is worthy of it all. The one who has created you, who has redeemed you, and seeks to make you whole, the person you're created to be. Say yes to him. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I've been seeking after my own will. I die to myself and I give you my life. Maybe you're here today and you know that you know that you're saved. By faith, you've received it. You know you have. And you so desire to live for him. First, praise him for his grace. The reminder that you've received again today. He has taken your sin upon the cross. You are fully loved and totally accepted by him. Now live like it. Lord, I pray for every person here, whatever that action is that you have called us to, whether it's to join the fellowship of the church today, to be baptized, to be in your word daily, to pray constantly. Lord, I pray that we all will become more like you, proving that we belong to you. And joy, peace, and purpose will be the thing that marks our lives. Lord, we love you and we praise you for your word and your spirit upon us now. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.